Great. Thank you very much, James, um, and welcome, everybody. My name's Juan Cruz, and I'm the principal of uh, Edinburgh College of Art at the University of Edinburgh, and it's my real pleasure to welcome you all to Tessa Giblin's lecture tonight, uh, titled On the Unmuting of Art. We're extremely fortunate at the university uh, and ECA to count with the gallery that we call our own. Having said that, it's also important to point out that Talbot Rice Gallery is not a university gallery, as that might usually be understood, but a gallery that operates within the context of a world-leading and research-intensive university with the ambition of developing inquiry, reach, and impact around curatorial practice through the conceptualization and instantiation of research-led exhibitions and other programs of engagement, such as tonight's lecture. Of course, the gallery doesn't uh, just do that by itself, uh, and Tessa's leadership, uh, vision, energy, and persuasiveness, together with her great team, uh, have enabled a really extensive and productive relationship to grow with research areas from across the university, leading to a series of fantastically innovative and engaging exhibitions that have enjoyed wide critical acclaim and raised the profile of the arts at Edinburgh College of Art and the university on an international scale. Tonight, Tessa will be talking about some of these exhibitions, uh, which arise from the curatorial direction she brought to and has developed at Talbot Rice Gallery, that actively seeks to bring the research power of the university into contact with contemporary art, to work into and generate insights around the national conversation, be that art in the age of Brexit, raising the volume of female self-empowerment in the wake of the Eighth Amendment referendum in Ireland, or the role of contemporary art in a post-pandemic world. Tessa joined Talbot Rice Gallery as director in November 2016. She's commissioner and curator of Ireland, at the Venice Biennale, Biennale 2017 with the artist um, Jesse Jones, producing the exhibition Tremble Tremble, uh, about which we will be speaking tonight and which forms the basis of one of our impact case studies for the REF in 2021, indicating, I think, the really integrated way in which uh, the, the, the Tobber Rice Gallery works with the university. From 2006 to 2016, she was curator of visual arts at Project Arts Centre in Dublin, where she curated numerous solo and group exhibitions and made commissioning new work a hallmark of the exhibitions. Uh, Tessa now lives in Edinburgh with her family. She was raised in Christchurch, New Zealand, where she attended Canterbury University School of Fine Arts and began her cultural formation through the network of artist-run spaces across Aotearoa, New Zealand. This lecture, um, I should say, was developed at the invitation of the artist uh, Big Van der Poel uh, for the summer school at Hospital Field, uh, which is themed around the, the, the title Making Mute. So I'm really, really delighted and proud to hand over to my brilliant colleague, Tessa Giblin. Thank you for the intro and thank you so much to my team who have helped pull off the, the lecture tonight. And to Big Van der Poel, uh, who gave me the invitation to collect these ideas for them uh, when they were curating the uh, summer school and, and hospital field. And a big welcome to everybody, to our friends and the artistic community, uh, colleagues, artists, I hope. Um, and a really warm welcome to the students. I know it's been a really uh, difficult um, beginning to the year. Every one of you that I've met is just singing with excitement and ambition and hope. So it's really been uplifting, I think, for all of us in the academic community to see you come in. So a really warm welcome to all students, particularly to ECA students. And a big shout out to the Beva Shekin Island students. And bravo on pulling off your degree show a few weeks ago. I loved watching it um, on social media. So I'm just going to share my screen. Can art have a real voice within social and political change? Do we need to unmute ourselves in believing in this potential? Unmute the potential power of art, and in my case, of exhibition making. I want to take you through a few case studies of artworks I've been involved with uh, that have something interesting, maybe even provocative to offer this question. And I'll take you through the story of Jesse Jones and Tremble Tremble and also some of the, the works in an exhibition called At the Gates. I'll try to bring these works to life for you in case you've not experienced them uh, yourself. But then what I really want to do is make a case for the unmuting of art itself. And I'll return to Tremble Tremble and describe, describe the act of political theatre that led me to understand and believe 
the loud and uh, raucous and impactful role that art can play in our society and as part of the national conversation. So Tremble, Tremble. It was made by the artist Jesse Jones with myself as the curator and the commissioner and a tight and tangled uh, relationship. And it was developed as an artwork to uh, represent Ireland at the Venice Biennale in uh, 2017. Um, although many of you will be really familiar with this Biennale, some of our students may not yet be. So Venice is basically the only international contemporary art event of its kind. It has a major themed exhibition at its core, you know, which is often a touchstone for conversation about curating for, for many, many years to come, and, and art, of course. Um, but it also has this unique pavilion structure of autonomous national representation. So many countries such as Great Britain, Japan, France and Australia, they have um, purpose-built pavilions, sort of a gallery within a large garden park, the Giardini. Uh, but others, such as Ireland and Scotland, have an itinerant structure and they find a new site for the pavilion every two years. Um, and in the year between for architecture, it's very busy. So conceptually, um, Tremble Tremble had, had many wounds. One was the then nascent call uh, in Ireland to repeal the Eighth Amendment, which was a movement to effectively legalise abortion in Ireland. The other was this fabulous woman, Silvia Federici, uh, and her work to locate the historic oppression of women in a history of capitalism. So Sylvia uniquely looked for the reason that women needed to be oppressed. If you're going to read one uh, book of Sylvia, read Caliban and the Witch. It's a great, precise, detailed romp through history uh, and often returning to the body, all bodies, as the site of exploitation. But in writing about the witch trials and the oppression of women, Sylvia was uniquely looking for reasons why, not just an account of how it was all done. So she addresses the historical moment when the early accumulation of capital necessitated, for those accumulating power, the systematic oppression of women. And she writes, there's no doubt that in the transition from feudalism to capitalism, women suffered a unique process of social degradation that was fundamental to the accumulation of capital and has remained so ever since. If you wanted to control capital in the 12th century, then you needed to control the source of the labor force, women, and their reproductivity. So this is when midwifery uh, was taken from women into the church of state. This is also when the church speaks out against male homosexuality as non-reproductive sex. This is the beginning of the oppression of women that will find its height in the hysteria of the witch trials. Um, but which haunts us still, and modern Ireland. Tremble, 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 inspired by the 1970s Italian wages for housework campaign that Silvia Federici was actually very involved in. And it remains involved in the struggle today. I heard her speaking just a few weeks ago um, as part of a series of conversations you can still find if you dial up 16 Beaver uh, about this ongoing unpaid labor that props up capitalism, capitalism that is largely, not only, but largely women's domestic labor. During the 1970s campaign, people would chant in Italian, uh, Tremate, tremate, tremble, tremble, the witches have returned. Sylvia writes, the body has been for women and capitalist society what the factory has been for male waged workers, the primary ground of their exploitation and resistance, as the female body has been appropriated by the state and men and forced to function as a means for the reproduction and accumulation of labor. So Jesse and I and a host of marvelous um, collaborators and experts worked with the pavilion sites to create an artwork that could be staged as components uh, that all performed over time, much like theater. Much like theater. 
I'll show you just uh, one clip in case you've never seen it, um, and one that I've selected to show for the formal transitions um, more than anything else. It's I could just watch that for hours. We've installed this six different times now, and I just I find myself enthralled every time. So originally, um, it included two large portrait orientation screens that you see there in that clip, filled with the body of the wonderful Olwen Fuere. Uh, two moving curtains printed with the images of Olwen's giant stretched out arms, two giant bone sculptures, you can still see one there at the bottom, and lights that were programmed to be doing different things uh, with a sound score made by the artist Susan Stenger that was arranged on site. So it was reflecting the room it was in, the acoustics were reflecting the room it was in and also how sound travels and moves and operates. Uh, we wanted to implicate audiences in what was going on in the work. And here is Jesse talking about that. Because I think one of the things I wanted to make was to make something that wasn't just a representation of the story of feminism or this kind of seismic feminism or this kind of return of, of witch power. I also wanted to create a pavilion that incorporated some of the physical and material apparatus of witchcraft. So there's a, a circulation in the space. Some of the aspects of the exhibition have been communicated to me through tarot cards or have come together through processes of dreaming so it's deeply connected to my unconscious as well as my research and political you know rational conscious so it's a merging of those things how can we merge the world of of the of the cerebral and the intellectual with also what, what we might feel politically and i think that's really important at this time in terms of how people feel very, very confused with this kind of break in truth and language. Mm. And I think it's also a, a break between our bodies and our, and our conscious minds. And I think we have to find a way to access things that are actually held in our body and articulate them. Throughout the, the work are various scenes which address a, a history of oppression of women and projecting sometimes into a very deep history, um, also gradually building a legal structure, the law of Inutira Gigante, which fancifully creates a legal dominion over all who reside in the womb of this giantess. So I've abridged what the giantess says, but includes, from the moment a human being begins to take its place of dwelling in the maternal belly, it lives inside a giant. The state acknowledges and affirms that the life of the giant, in virtue of his status as the origin of all life, shall be protected and vindicated before all other emerging lives she may generate. Be it ordained and enacted that the giant from which life emerges possesses a power to create and to destroy the life she carries, 
the state accordingly guarantees to pass no law attempting to infringe upon the fundamental rights of in Gutierrez gigante. So you can see what the artwork is doing in this uh, legal speech in evoking the mother's right to bodily self-determination, which was really at the core of the struggle against the Eighth Amendment in Ireland. You can feel here also with the giants that Jesse Jones is calling on the Irish Celtic mythology, but also unmuting mute figures of the past. So there's a scene in which the actress, Alwyn, um, is filmed as though she is asleep. Sorry. Sorry, it's this image. Over to the left here, you can see it's a part of uh, Alwyn's body being filmed as though she's asleep. She is actually asleep. She fell asleep when we were filming this. Alwyn is so zen that she can fall asleep on a, on a film set. Um, uh, so she, it's a voiceover that's narrating the conditions of her death. And the story that's been told is the story of Lucy Australopithecus. Um, who was the oldest hominid remains that we have. And it's Lucy's bones, you know, the, the, the bones are held in a museum, obviously, but it's Lucy's bones that Jesse Jones has exaggerated in this bone sculpture that you can see um, at the beginning in these giant sized sculptures. So as well as making her giant sized, she's pulling us back in time, or at least creating a sense of a lineage between women what Jesse calculates as 28 generations of women to have survived the witch trials. Uh, another of the scenes recreates the last words of Temperance Lloyd, burned at the stake in England in 18, oh, 1682. Did I disturb ye, good people? I hopes I disturb you. I hopes I disturb you enough to want to see this, your house, in ruins all around you. Have you had enough yet? Or do you still have time for chaos? Huh? More? I'll be watching you. You won't forget us. Even if you try and sweeps us away. You who survive will mean naught. Temperance knows you'll be sorry. Well, I had wanted for a long time to stop thinking about making art as a way of displaying things, but to think about it as a way of arranging objects, almost like ruins, and to kind of see how, how they lie and how the relationships that they set up in the world can create a kind of alchemy and allow that to open up and then see what unfolds when you allow those pieces to fall where they may. On, on the so what manner of spell is it that we're... The first, the first manner of spell is you're given a clue to it at the entrance. There's uh, this piece of legal uh, ephemera that is used within it. Um, the first is to really promote and manifest psychically for the repeal of the Eighth Amendment in the Irish Constitution. So that's the first energy that's, that's placed into it. And from that, the unravelling. But really it's from the cognition of the mother as the site of this, this really potent cognitive power. So when people see Temperance Lloyd coming at them in this way, it is meant to really trigger for people a hidden cognitive kind of spell in their own brain that they might remember what that sensation felt like to be the Lilliputian in relationship to the female body. So the, <clears throat> the filmed parts of the work, they're largely set against this um, former British magistrate's court, 
which I think I sacrificed a good six months of my life trying to source. But it was really crucial uh, that this was genuine legal material which could ostensibly be imagined to have witnessed legality against women. And in the background, of course, colonial oppression. Um, and at the same time, it's difficult to image it, but see here on the left, here beginneth auspiciously the first part of this work. That's actually part of the Malleus Maleficarum, uh, which the actress on the other screen is reciting backwards as, as though she's regurgitating the text. And so this Malleus Maleficarum uh, was essentially a guide to the identifying, accusing, trying, and destroying women accused of witchcraft, which in its day in the 15th century sold less copies only than the Bible. So a very hugely um, influential and destructive book. It was known as the Hammer of the Witches. Now, all of these scenes, they don't create like a linear narrative or anything like that. They more build towards an atmosphere of the giantess in whom's womb we reside and an atmosphere of 28 generations of women stretching back through time, even deep time, in the case of Lucia Strala Pithecus's skeletal remains. As the work toured around the world and was re-energized, we made almost at each venue, the work evolved and Jesse adding new elements based on new research into each context. So here in Singapore, uh, she made a burning table based on the tradition of the hungry ghost, which, how, which she, on which she burned uh, copies of the Irish bill from 1821 to abolish or repeal an act of witchcraft and sorcery in Ireland from 1586. So effectively she's sending medieval Irish women the tools of their emancipation. Uh, in Scotland, we included these scratchings and circular scratchings on the wall, wall and performative gestures, but we also, Juan, I don't even know if you know we did this, we also um, scratched an orifice into the floor of William Henry Playfair's 19th uh, century gallery. It looked as though we did it, we didn't really do it. Um, and out of this orifice, plumes of smoke would sometimes be emerging. We also included a scold's bridle um, that, was, that we made here based on one of the ones that in the National Museum over there. I'm gesturing directly over there. Uh, which was this you know, horrendous instrument of torture, shame, and yes, silencing that women accused of witchcraft would be made to wear and paraded around the streets. Uh, in Ireland, this millstone uh, on which the slow grind of the law was enacted, and in Spain, at the Guggenheim and Bilbao, <laughs> um, many of the elements were retained, as well as some Agiziola totems wrapped in beeswax, which are, are burned to ward off nefarious spirits, which I can't show you because the Guggenheim are very odd about pictures, but I'm working on it. <laughs> So I'm going to pause on the Tremble Tremble front for a second, and I want to discuss some of the works from At the Gates. This was the second exhibition that I curated in Edinburgh at the same time. We had it on the other galleries at the same time as Tremble Tremble, and later it, it toured uh, to France. And it presented artists who rub up against the law or institutions of power, and artworks that tell stories of violence, campaigning, rehabilitation, and exploitation in and around women's histories. It was really motivated by the complex struggle of women to find, protect, and even rehabilitate their voice. The title, uh, At the Gates, was a mashup of an American suffragist ba banner that Jessie actually shared with me. So you can see this curator-artist relationship. It's symbiotic, it goes both ways. Bearing the words, the young are at the gates. Based on a 1917 speech of Lavinia Dock, she said, the old stiff minds must give way. The old selfish minds must go. Obstructive reactionaries must move on. The young are at the gates. And the title was also a reflection on Kafka's parable before the law. This is a story about a man who spends his life standing at the gates of the law, awaiting permission to enter, only to be told just before his death that the reason no one else passed through those gates is that they'd been assigned only to him. And with that, the gates are closed. So to me, and also with Tremble Tremble, in fact, um, 
many of the artworks that I've become obsessed with, it, there's an indication of some kind of kinship between art and the law, both of them being simple human constructs, institutions created by humankind, and through art's inventive and provocative possibility, perhaps creating the same possibility for the law. One of the artists I want to talk about is Olivia Plender. She, uh, this installation, I have a bit of sound, uh, which should hopefully work. Uh, the work is called Learning to Speak Sense from 2015 and was made after Olivia experienced a disease which literally took away her ability to speak. It was a, it was a dreadful uh, condition that she developed. And I think it was something like a year um, before she was able to regain her voice. And it was in this process of rehabilitation that gave rise to the work. And rough and thickly coated and thickly coated. Just, just if you don't mind. So, d, 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 Olivia said, when I lost my ability to speak for a whole year after this illness in 2013, it profoundly changed the way I thought about that subject. Being literally voiceless, I felt vulnerable in public space, and over the course of my treatment, I was exposed to a lot of institutional settings, such as hospitals. Many of the words, phrases, and sentences that I was given as exercises by the hospital appeared to me to have some kind of hidden political message. For example, many maids make much noise. Or another phrase that I had to repeat, militant miners means more money. Both seem to speak about the power of the collective voice to be heard, to demand attention, to make noise. And in the British context, any reference to militant miners immediately seemed to indicate the miners' strike of the 1980s. And I became convinced that there was an anonymous author working as a care worker within the NHS who's distributing their clandestine messages through the voices of individuals who are learning to speak. And she told me later as well that uh, about, the no about the voice therapy and the amount of politicians we actually know and see on stage today who have completely altered their voices and able to enable them to gain more power. She, I think she was given a choice when she rehabilitated her voice of what would you like it to sound like. Another work uh, in this exhibition was Teresa Magoyas's um, Opening Paths to Social Justice. To the, that's the translation. This shows the work in which designs have been embroidered onto fabric previously stained with blood from the body of a woman who had been assassinated in Guatemala City. So she's taking this potent erratic material to work with and Magoyas asked people from different communities throughout the Americas to work back into these objects of trauma. In documentary films uh, that, that Teresa made to go with it, we see that the group of artisans, in this case, <clears throat> Mayans of Guatemala, showing care and respect for the dead woman, acknowledging her and her ongoing gift as they worked, but often asking her permission in various gestures or ceremonies. And as one of the Guatemalan embroiders uh, states during the video shown alongside, the blood spread on this fabric could have been any one of us. Her body is going to help us all. She's giving us freedom. She's giving us the voice, the energy, and the strength to be able to report so other sisters don't have to go through what she lived through, what she suffered. These artisans, despite, they describe their actions variously as repairs or healing or embellishments, while Magoyas herself refers to them as microphones through which local participants could express their concerns, their concerns about violence and about women. And thirdly, um, Maya Bezhevik, who... Yeah. Maya, I'll just come onto it because it'll start when I come into it, but I just want to introduce it to say who, in this film work, subjects herself to this ongoing badgering, escalating into violence of a man who repeats the phrase, how do you want to be governed? I've, um, I've started it a few minutes in, and I'm just going to show you a really short segment. Mm. Oh, 
how do you want to be governed? How do you want to be governed? Come on. How do you want to be governed? How do you want to be governed? Come on, tell me. Tell me. How do you want to be governed? 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 Tell me. Tell me. I'll have to leave it without the image, but um, the subject, Maya Bijevic, she remains mute throughout the interrogation, so she's passively resisting this increasingly aggressive interlocutor. So what comes across really powerfully and is quite affecting after eight minutes is that this question, how do you want to be governed, presented as though you have a voice, uh, is a question impossible to answer from a position of inequality. Her enduring silence reinforces the idea that resistance is a constant labor. It's a, and it's very interesting uh, for me how strongly the public responded to it, especially young people, people who felt excited by activist work, excited by the idea of finding a voice, but overawed about how to find it. So this work of endurance, of, of voluntary endurance, as the artwork is, of course, Maya Bejevic's body, was also an homage to a... Uh, 1976 artwork um, by Rasa Todashevic called What is Art? And it became a real provocation for, I think these were ECA students that I was speaking with at this time. And so finally, these images, these banners, uh, the collective of artists and artisans who made the banners to repeal the Eighth Amendment. They are fabulous objects in their own right, used in protest marches throughout Ireland over the last three to four years made as individuals, sometimes as collective, but crucially made to be marched. So this brings my, sp my story back to Ireland and the second part of what I want to say. And this is more about art uh, curating and curating within a national conversation. When we were selected for Venice, it was 2016, and it was a wonderfully t tumultuous time in Ireland. The right to same-sex marriage had been won through popular referendum in 2015, which is a world first. And since then, momentum had been gathering for yet another attempt to repeal the Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution basically equated the life of the fetus to the life of the mother in the eyes of the state and the law, making abortion in Ireland illegal and forcing thousands of women to travel the Irish Sea every year, turning Irish problems into British problems and causing trauma to be suffered in secret and in shame. From the outset, we wanted Tremble Tremble to be part of this growing momentum, to be part of the national conversation. Jesse described the conflict through uh, the conflict I beg your pardon, that this gave rise to when representing her country at the opening ceremony in the Venice Biennale. Jesse and I, standing side by side with the Irish ambassador, sandwiched in between, and Jessie started telling the story of her struggle with national identity through the story of Savita Halapanava. She, worked, she, she spoke about waking up in Seoul, Korea, where she was making a work in the demilitarized zone, to the news that the Irish dentist, Savita Halapanava, had died in a hospital in Cork. You might remember this story. It drove tens of thousands of people into the streets of Ireland in the following weeks. Savita had a septic pregnancy. Uh, and the fetus she was carrying was, was dying. But because doctors could, not, could still uh, recognize a heartbeat, they were unable to terminate the pregnancy and unable to give Savita the chance she needed to survive the ordeal. The doctors were trapped by the Eighth Amendment too. At the opening ceremony, Jessie spoke of being unable to answer people in Korea who would ask her, but why? Why would your country do this? And at the end of a passionate speech, I know some of you were there, she said in a thick voice, all my artistic life, I've been aware of the Venice Biennale and this huge honor of representing my country. But when the time came, when I was ready for that, I was overwhelmed by a feeling of injustice in relation to the Irish constitution. How can I represent my country when my country doesn't represent me? We opened Tremble Tremble in May 2017 in Venice, and after mounting pressure from the people of Ireland, 10 months later, the date of the referendum was set for the 25th of May 2018. 
Now, there were artists who were directly part of the campaign. These artists were making banners for the abortion rights marches that held direct messages and had a stated purpose in mind. And Jessie herself was certainly out there marching and door knocking as momentum grew in Dublin. But Tremble Tremble was different. It sought a different kind of power, an abstract, conceptual, historical, shivering power. Alva Murphy, who led the Yes campaign that sought to repeal the Eighth Amendment, said it beautifully during speeches when the work finally returned to Dublin a week after the referendum was won. It was like you knew in witch-like fashion exactly what we needed to do and to hear and to see and to fear. So when you're selected to represent your nation at Venice, at some stage, someone sits you down and says, what do you want to get out of this? And in unison, Jesse and I would laugh and say, well, to repeal the Eighth Amendment, obviously. But quickly, Jesse would zone in on the work becoming part of serious feminist discourse. And for my part, I set my sights on Michael D. Higgins and immediately invited him to open the pavilion. Ireland's poet president is a remarkable human and an exceptionally intelligent, enlightened, politically talented and philosophically astute person everything you want in a president. But unable to give his opinion or use his influence on the abortion rights debate due to being president and what that role means in Ireland. When we were delightfully surprised and received notice that he'd accepted my invitation and was going to visit the artwork in Venice a few weeks after it opened, it came with the most extraordinary little side note, the most impactful little side note I can ever remember receiving. The president will visit the Pavilion of Ireland at the Venice Biennale and afterwards continue on to visit the Pope in Rome. So the president was going to spend a day inside our strident, feminist, Eighth Amendment repealing provocation of an artwork on his way to visit the Pope. As an act of political theater, this meant everything. I mean, alongside the president's visit, which was amazing in itself, he was quoting poets, he discussed the two most recent books of Noam Chomsky, he described the alchemy between art and politics, came the diplomats, the ambassadors, the president's team, press, and suddenly we found Tremble Tremble on the six o'clock news, rerunning for the next 48 hours, as well as news feeds coming from the president's media team, describing an artwork which was taking its message of female bodily autonomy and the need for women to decide the fate of their own bodies to the world stage, with the president then continuing on to see, to Rome, to see the Pope. And you can imagine how that read. The artwork reached 615,000 visitors who came to the Venice Biennale, but this narrative reflected back into the living rooms departure lounges, bars and gyms all over Ireland. And although issues about the Eighth Amendment were by now commonly in the media, this felt different. This felt like the president staking his position in a debate he was constitutionally forbidden from commenting on. This felt like Ireland's cultural reputation entwining with its political direction. It felt like art playing a vital role. I've always believed in art, artistic experiences having the power to change us and through changing us, change the world. But never had I been part of something that moved the cogs of influence so elegantly and, and so powerfully. In the following 12 months, all sorts of miraculous things occurred in Ireland, the most poignant of which was the silent 20% turning out to be repealers. A year after after we opened the work in Venice, counter to many people's fears and projections, including my own, we opened Tremble Tremble in Dub Dublin one week after the referendum was won. Ireland seemed to me to be a place reborn. Now, art is only a small, tiny little fragment of the enormous cultural, political, religious, ethical debate that had gripped the nation for the previous three months. But I want to share with you some of the speech made by Alvin Smith at our opening in Dublin. Did I say Alva Murphy before? If I did, I am absolutely mortified. I hope I didn't do that. Alva Smith. <laughs> Alva had been an abortion rights campaigner for many decades and led the Yes campaign through to its victory. 
those were heady days. And on the night of our opening, Elva herself hadn't yet rested from the campaign. Project Art Centre was steaming with emotion for what had been achieved and for the voice that art had within it. I'm going to end by reading you some of Elva's speech that I've cut and mashed together. It's truly an excavation of what it means to be a woman. And because it has been so long suppressed, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Because what is hauled up by this witch with such difficulty and intense labor is the truth of what it is in the first place to have been buried for so long. Of course, our power as women had to be silenced and suppressed. It's, pre it's precisely because we are the source. We are that origin that we have had to be kept silent for so long. What we brought up as a people in that referendum result is the sense of our power, a power which we mustn't ever allow to be buried, dismissed or denied. You first have to disturb, you first have to disrupt. And in this tiny little part of Europe and the world, the old order is finally gone. It was in 2017 that I know you made the work. She's speaking to, to Jesse in this speech. It's in 2017 that I know you made the work, but you knew in which like fashion exactly what we needed to do and to hear and to see and to fear. And I recall the Taoiseach, Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, saying that he had witnessed a quiet revolution. And I thought, interesting. What he had actually witnessed was the putting to an end to decades and centuries of turmoil and suffering and pain and terror and dread and cruelty. And that we certainly as women and men, you may join in, but we certainly as women would never, ever be quiet ever again. And in many ways, oh, beg your pardon, <laughs> there's Albert. In many ways, that was uh, the end of our story of social and political change. Although the artwork has continued to be shown. It finished at the Guggenheim in Bilbao just before the pandemic struck. And Jessie's currently preparing it for the Adelaide Festival in Australia. The last culminating moments was to present Sylvia Federici with an honorary degree from the University of Edinburgh. Giving her laureation at that graduation ceremony was really one of the honors of my life as her compassion and her rigor continues to echo all around her. Since this experience, I've developed a curatorial practice or a direction at Talbot Rice Gallery that actively inserts exhibitions into the national conversation. What my colleague in the gallery, James Clegg, who spoke earlier, likes to call staying with the trouble. He's as, he's as obsessed with Donna Haraway as I am with Silvia Federici. So there was an exhibition called Borderlines in 2019, which looked at borders in the age of Brexit, but all sorts of borders, conceptual, geographic, uh, financial, indigenous, Ireland and Northern Ireland, um, and which we planned to, to coincide with the exact months that the UK was originally set to withdraw from the EU. I think I personally learned more about the implications of Brexit on Scotland and the UK from curating that show uh, than anything else I managed to read or watch or debate. And our current project in development uh, is called The Normal, so no prizes <laughs> for guessing what that's about. But we're trying to make it the first exhibition that we open when we finally get back into this amazing space. Um, we want it to look at what this pandemic year has meant to us for a, from a variety of angles, viruses and their symbiotic relationship to evolution, the asymmetry of this pandemic due to the socio-political and racial inequality, the proof that we can in fact step, up, step off the train of progress, listening to the birds, eating the abundance of honey that's been produced across Edinburgh, uh, and urging a new relationship to the production of art in these times. Perhaps still, even holding out hope that this ever increasing proximity to viruses as the polar caps melt, as wildlife are interfered with through marketization and deforestation, that this will all lead to change, critical focused change to stop this climate catastrophe. And with these sorts of exhibitions, timing matters, context is everything. The national conversation, it needs art and exhibition making to contribute to it because it needs diversity, 
surprise, history, adversity, poetics, and yes, activism. It's curating in real time, and it's, it's filled with risk. But I believe that art can change how we live, act, perceive ourselves, and therefore can change the world. These projects I've described to you, they're personal to me, but they live in the public realm. They're sometimes part of the national discourse, and they come from artists who know that their art is not separate from the world around them. Thank you. <laughs>